Dumela, Sagubona, hello, Molweni, good evening, and welcome to SciFest Africa. I think the show, the, 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 the session tonight is called Tales of the Ocean. My name is Freddie Mashate, the manager of SciFest Africa, and I'm glad to be your host tonight. I'm expecting a lot, excited, super, super, super excited, and I hope you, our guests, are also excited. Please do interact with us throughout this whole session. And if you are on the Zoom platform, please use the Q&A section to communicate with us, whether that is a comment or question. And of course, if you are on Facebook, then please use the comment section. We want you to interact with us. We are here for you. So please, please, please interact with us. For those of you that are, that are on Facebook, please share this broadcast with your friends. And I know that if you just type in their name in the comment section, Facebook will be faithful enough to inform them and hopefully they will be joining us uh, in, 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 a bit in, in, in the near future. Um, I just want to start off by saying that this session is presented to you by SciFest Africa, South Africa's National Science Festival. It is of course uh, part of the first ever online festival in 24 years. And we are super excited about that. The theme of the year this year is Tech Root Nature which celebrates the International Year of Plant Health as declared by the UNESCO. We of course realize that plants form an essential part of all lives. Before we, uh, as we start actually, I would like to just introduce Dr. Sink, uh, who will just come and speak to us a little bit about what she does, introduce Loiso, who is a young marine scientist, and also introduce the first part of today's session. Uh, Dr. Kerry Sink, uh, works across the science, science policy field with research on foundation marine biodiversity science, marine ecosystem classification and mapping, biodiversity assessment and marine spatial planning. She is committed to the translation of science into decision making and building capacity in African marine science and management. Kerry has an extensive experience in multi uh, sector stakeholder engagement and mainstream marine biodiversity biodiversity priority into fisheries, mining, and the petroleum sector. After 10 years of systematic planning, she helped advance, uh, advanced implementation of 20 new marine protected areas in South Africa through a presidential blue economy initiative. Kerry heads up the marine program at the South African National Biodiversity Institute, Sanbi, a position she has occupied since 2006 she is a 2016 Pew Fellow and a researcher associate at Nelson Mandela University. Kerry is branching into transdisciplinary work and is exploring new ways of knowing in, in the deep sea and the use of marine species in traditional medicine and rituals. Marine, thank you very much for honoring our invitation. I'm just going to hand over to you. I'll be joining the session once uh, the first part of this session is done. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for this opportunity to share two of my favorite things, science and storytelling. Um, the video that you're about to see is the Mzansi video. And it's a video that we made to communicate about our marine protected areas in South Africa. We're really proud of this video. It's directed by Otto Whitehead and myself and Judy Mann from the Oceanographic Research Institute uh, were producers of this film. And we really wanted to get across that the ocean has different meanings to the diverse cultures in South Africa. We still have a long way to go to address challenges and, and legacy issues with our marine protected area network. But this film really showcases some of the scientific work that's been done in the country by many of the young scientists. You're gonna meet one of them tonight. On, on, on this panel with us is Luiso Dunga. Luiso was a master student of mine, but he is graduating now and with distinction, he produced the map of kelp forests for the country using remote sensing. And he's helped to assess the state of our marine ecosystem. So without further ado, let's have a look at the film. And then later on, we'll be chatting with Luiso. Thank you, Freddie. Mm -hmm. 
the mountain in the sea. Esikaleni, the place of thunder. Zanti, alive with possibility. Ocean has many meanings, but what does it mean to you? It's a place for reflection. <laughs> A Beneath its blue surface hide creatures far beyond our wildest dreams. The deeper we go, the more we learn. South African scientists are making incredible discoveries in our deep seas. Corals that are thousands of years old. The only known gathering of giant guitar sharks on the planet. Fields of sea pens home to young fish. Volcanic mountains covered with kelp forests. Mud plains sprawling with strange crabs and fishes. Ancient animals once thought extinct. Reefs home to fish found nowhere else on Earth. Sponges and sea slugs with cancer fighting compounds. Who knows what else is waiting to be discovered? These ecosystems are the foundations for the seafood that we eat, provide millions of South Africans with jobs, and enhance our resilience to climate change. Our oceans attract millions of tourists every year and provide billions of rands to the South African economy. We have recognized the huge potential of the ocean. In 2014, the South African government launched Operation Patisa, to develop our ocean economy. This involves the expansion of marine and coastal tourism, the development of harbors and ports, aquaculture and mariculture, and offshore oil and gas. South Africa's development path aims to grow the economy while accounting for sustainability and the need for healthy, thriving oceans. To safeguard the benefits our oceans give us, South Africa is increasing the extent of our marine protected areas from 0.4 towards 5%. Join us in celebrating the treasures of our oceans.
By protecting the seas of today, we ensure a rich heritage for our children. We owe it to them to make sure that our oceans are as healthy as possible. Healthy oceans, healthy people, healthy planet. Eyo nanti balik lagi untuk kau bana masing dan lebih pelengkap selepas nak jongi apa pemuat mas jonge fa apa siapa kuku tapa siapa ini jongo zaitun untuk bana aku nak pilih kau 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 benefit itu nama benefit ini sesuatu ini sesuatu ini sesuatu ini sesuatu Wow, wow, wow. My takeaway from the video, healthy ocean, healthy people, healthy planet. Um, as we move on, the ocean has many secrets not known to humankind. It has layers of mysteries, tales, and myths attached to it. One receives overwhelming mixed emotions at sea view, a true reflection of nature's beauty that leaves many ponderings and questions of what lies beyond the blue. The tranquility and smell of the deep saline waters truly have a story to tell. And it is one of these many stories that Dr. Klina will be telling us today. Dr. Klina Mklope is an author, poet, playwright, director, performer, and storyteller. She has performed her stories in theaters like the Royal Albert Hall, the Kennedy Center in the USA, and collaborated with the ladies uh, with Lady Smith Black Mambazo on a children's CD. She has re released several CDs as part of her work promoting indigenous languages, oral traditions, and literacy. She has written over 18 books, which have been translated into all South African languages. She has received seven honorary doctorates from the likes of London Open University UK, University of KwaZulu Natal. University of Pretoria and Fort Hare. Dr. Mklope has also received several Lifetime Achievement Awards for this work amongst many others. She founded the Kuinamasiko Arts and Heritage Trust in 2012 in an, in an effort to preserve the dignity and wealth of our indigenous culture heritage in South Africa. She continued to lead the organization as its executive director. Thank you so very much, Dr. Klina, for accepting once again our invitation. Uh, the floor is all yours. I'm just handing over to you. Me and many others await the storytelling session. I actually have pop, pop, popcorn here with me. Thank you, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a lovely, lovely um, platform to be sharing stories and also talking about one of my favorite things, the ocean. I love this ocean. Uh, it traveled all over the world. And when I realized that uh, there was nothing that could make me happier than being closer to the ocean, I was um, even more fortunate to find a place where I could live right in the Indian Ocean. So I'm very, very blessed indeed. And today is a special day for me. I'd like to share a story I haven't told in ages. And this is the story that I heard when I was quite young and I didn't tell it and then I told it and then I published it in a book. And um, now I want to share it with you. A very long time ago, when the world was still young and people lived in many villages in different parts of the world, there was a community that lived up, up on the mountains. And down below there were forests, and further on there were plains and leading towards an ocean far away. And in that village, there was a young girl who dreamed of the ocean. She'd never seen, she'd never been to the ocean, but she dreamed that one day she would see the ocean with her own eyes. And also this girl, ah, Kosiam Unozudu, you call her sky. 
she enjoyed the bright blue sky and also she was adventurous. She listened to the birds and wondered what faraway places they had been to. <laughs> she thought she'd never, never marry any man who did not come from a seaside village because she wanted to spend the rest of her life by the ocean. Well, when she was of marriable age, men came to ask for a hand in marriage. She did not accept even one of them until one day she met a man who came from a seaside village who loved her and she loved him. And she traveled with him to that village and to sit on the sand and listen to the waves of the ocean. She felt like, yes, her life was complete. She learned to swim. Ah, she learned to fish. She learned many, many things about the ocean, except the mother-in-law was not so happy with this girl. Why didn't she marry somebody from the mountain villages where she came from? My son, mm -mm, he didn't choose well. He should have chosen somebody from here. Our people are much better than those mountain uh, village people. She was in love. He was in love. The two of them were happy. Soon they had a child a beautiful baby girl. And what name would they give her except Noloanle, the girl of the ocean? It was a beautiful name and the child laughed and grew and learned to crawl and stand up and walk and learn to swim, but it wasn't able to swim so much because she was a tiny little thing. They would take her to the beach, but the mother-in-law never wanted to assist with taking care of the child when this young woman needed to work. She decided, no, I don't have time. I don't have time for assisting you because you are not the right girl. You're not the right bride. You're not the right wife for my son. I know he's still gonna wake up and find a better wife. Well, 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 she decided that she had to go and work in the fields. She had to take care of the goats. She had to do all kinds of work that young brides had to do. And she had a baby. She would put her child on her back and go to work. But sometimes she felt she couldn't do this all day long. So she started something, a ritual that other people didn't know about. She would stand in front of the ocean on the sand and call to the waves of the ocean. The waves of the ocean, whoosh, whoosh, they came closer and picked up the child and the child went into the ocean and she bounced up on the wave. Oh, she laughed, she giggled, and the mother saw the baby was happy up on the waves of the ocean. She was working and removing the weeds from the fields. She did all kinds of works. And when the shadows were beginning to be longer towards the ocean, she knew it was time to get her child and go back to prepare some food at home to prepare supper and everything. She would go to the ocean and call the ocean to bring back her child. And the waves came closer and closer, whoosh. And the child rolled on the sand and she laughed and the mother quickly picked her up and dried her, put her on her back and went back home. This was the most amazing way of having your child being taken care of by the ocean. How lucky can you be? every single day now, that's what she did. The, the, the mother-in-law didn't know what she was doing with the child, carrying the baby on her back every day when she went to work. But that's <laughs> the secret that she was happy to keep. And other villagers saw it was strange, but they said nothing about it. The following day, she went back. <laughs> The waves came and picked up the child and the child went into the ocean and she was bouncing on the waves, bouncing on the waves, laughing, having a wonderful time indeed. And the mother worked and worked in the afternoon, picked the child, went back home. It was one such day. The child was 
over two years, maybe heading for three years old now, she took the child to the ocean because it was the done thing. She was loving it and the child had been safe all this time. She sang and the ocean took the baby and she was relaxed and doing her job. When she went back in the afternoon, she couldn't see her child. The waves had taken her further and further into the ocean. She sang and sang. She ran up and down on the beach, down and up. She kept on running and running. She couldn't see her child. Soon, the ocean was quiet. It was still. It was late afternoon. She cried and cried until she was exhausted and she fainted right there on the beach. That is where the villagers gathered. That is where her husband came and found her and picked her up and took her back home. The mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. What did she think she was doing? Giving a child to the ocean. I mean, honestly, who's ever heard of an ocean babysitting a child? I knew she was the wrong one for my son. Well, they cried and mourned the loss of their child. Oh, many, many sad days and nights. They went to the ocean to look and nothing. The child never came back. Well, Noloanje went further and further away in the ocean. She was safe. She kept on, kept on. She was carried by different ocean creatures until many hours later, she ended up at a, an ocean, a, 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 an island. And in that island, she was thrown onto the sand. A childless couple saw this baby and they rushed to pick her up and they looked at her. Where did she come from? They couldn't tell what age she was, maybe two or three. They brought her to their home and they wondered where she had come from, what was going on, but they accepted her with so much love. She was going to be their child until somebody came to, cl came to claim her. They decided because she had come from the ocean, they would give her the name Noloanle the girl of the ocean, uh, her own name. So she was home again. And this couple was not an ordinary couple. Both husband and wife were healers, well-known and respected healers. They used all kinds of plants from land and from under the ocean. They used all kinds of intricate from the, the, the whale fat. They used different types of, of tree bark and roots. They used any kind of thing you can imagine to heal. People came from far and wide to ask for their assistance. No longer grew. She was loved. She was cherished. She was a playful, happy girl and they taught her as much as they knew about healing. They taught her how to swim, how to play in the ocean. She could go down and dive. She learned so much about this huge mass of water called ocean that she was named Africa. No longer. She was home. She lived with this couple and as they grew older, and older, they kept sitting with her. You know, this is very important. This heals this kind of illness. If somebody has got this kind of illness, this is what you need to do. They taught her everything they knew. She was just like a sponge, taking in all this wisdom, all this healing knowledge. No longer was happy with this couple. And as they grew older and older, they said, you know, you might want to go back to where you came from. You need to go back to find your parents. She said, but I'm home. You are my parents. I don't know who my parents are. I don't know where I came from. You say I came from the ocean. Where, where exactly in the ocean do I go to look for my parents? Well, one afternoon, they took a big leather bag and they put different types of herbs and bones and different types of concoctions and they gave to her. And they said, take this bag and go into the ocean. This ocean knows you. This is your own mother and father more than we are your mother and father. You go back into the ocean. I know, I just believe you will find your parents again. She was weeping. She didn't want to go. You don't want me anymore. They told her we want you more than we've ever wanted anything, but we are old. We don't want to leave you like this. We want you to find your original, your own biological parents. Huh. 
sad, sad, sad like that. She went into the ocean. She swam. She was a good swimmer. She swam and swam. And soon she couldn't see the island anymore. She kept on and on. And what do you know? She knew the creatures of the ocean. One minute it was a dolphin carrying her. Another time it was a whale. Ha! Huh? Umkome, taking her. Another time, it was a sea turtle. She lay on a sea turtle and off she went. She was 15 years old now. That's right, a 15 year old, beautiful girl of the ocean. She was carrying this treasure of a big, big bag given to her by her parents from an island who were great healers and giving her the gift and a profession. And she continued. They carried her, carried her. She didn't know where the ocean or the whales or the dolphins or the sea turtles were taking her. She kept on and on until finally, the following morning, the sun was about up there. She arrived at a village. There were children playing outside, running, giggling, falling. Others were diving into the ocean, swimming. It was just a happy scene. She came out of the water. She was dripping wet, pulling the heavy bag, pulling the heavy bag, and she put it down and greeted those children. They were shocked. Their eyes couldn't open wide enough. Ayo, who is this? She greeted them. Do not be afraid. My name is Noloante. I need to find my parents. I don't know. Have you, have you ever heard uh, of a child maybe who got lost? Or could it be this village where I might have come from? I don't know which village I came from. Maybe, maybe our, our parents know. They went and they called their parents. There's, 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 a, there's a big sister here who says she was lost. She's carrying a big bag. And the old women, the young women, men, everybody. Hi, Mo! After such a long time, she is back. What is your name? My name is Noloanle. I apparently was taken away from some village and I was taken by the ocean and, and then I went to live. What? Your parents need you, especially your mother. Your mother. <sighs> Sky, she is not well at all. Please hurry, go and see her before she goes to the land of the ancestors. Before she passes on, come and see her. They led her to a home. And when she got there, there was a woman lying there on her bed, very, very sick, unable to even open her eyes. And her husband stood up. What did you say your name is? My name is Noloan. Well, what is wrong with her? Oh, she's very sad. She never really, really recovered after losing our beautiful daughter, Noloan. Are you my parents? So she quickly took her bag and found what she thought she could use. She dried some of the herbs, made a fire, and then she got to work trying to help her mother and made some medicine and boiled and cooled it down and seeded it and then gave her in a cup to drink. And the mother, and the following day, her daughter was there. And the following week, her daughter was there. She was gaining strength, getting better and better. But apart from getting better, you could not wipe the smile away from her face. <laughs> she was so happy. She couldn't believe the miracle of this ocean she had loved so much. Her daughter was taken away by the ocean. Her daughter went to learn to be a healer who learned so much about the very depths of the ocean, who was going to teach them so much more. We always say umuntu ufunda as a afe. A person learns until the day they die. The father said, you know, the day I stop learning is the day I stop living. Please, child, teach us. What do you know about this deep, deep, mysterious, unfathomable ocean? This Nzulu Yepishagalo, this Nzulu Yesimanga. Talk to us. Who were those parents who brought you up? who gave you this gift, who cherished you so much and saved you so that you would come back to us again. She told them story after story after story. People from the village, young and old, children sat in that home. People brought food, they brought drinks, and they brought fish, they brought everything you can imagine, and they listened to Noloan. And when people were 
told that there was a healer. Somebody was brought to meet this young girl who was such a good healer. She was taken to different villages to assist whenever people needed a healer. And she grew to be an amazing, amazing, precious gift, a treasure, not only to her mother and her father, but also to her community, to the people at large. Oh, Sanusa Sagwan too. And people would beat the drums and they would sing and they would call on the spirits of the ancestors. They would call on the spirits of the very depths of the ocean. They would thank the turtles. They would thank the whales. They would thank the dolphins. They would thank the starfish. They would thank the crabs. Oh, Pungane. They would thank so many, many, many mysterious living beings under the ocean and they would thank the sky that cherished her mother so much. They would thank the husband, this amazing man who was her father, who knew where to find the love of his life who was gonna change everything in their community. Just to see, that's where I rest this story. And with this story of Nolwandle, I plead with, with each and every one of you, cherish nature respect mother nature if we do not respect mother nature we will assure to cherish to perish we will perish because if we do not respect nature and this great great ocean and life and the plants and all that is around nature came before we humans were here and nature will survive with or without us so let us do all in our power to share these stories, to learn and grow and survive. Because we will survive if we honor this nature that has given us so much and continues to do so. Thank you, thank you so much. Wow, wow, wow. Um, that was beautiful. And at the end, it comes with that yeah. lesson to say, we should cherish nature. Dr. Tina, thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate oh, yes. the story and lessons oh, yes. that flow from it. Okay. So we now are so we lucky. are just- We are so lucky. Yeah. Yeah. So now nature we Nature has been patient with us, but it won't be patient forever. Yeah. Very powerful, very powerful. And if you are watching us uh, from Facebook, please do interact with us. This is now the discussion session that we're getting into where we are inviting Dr. Sink to come back along with Loiso so that they can also share the platform with us. Uh, do interact with us. We want to hear what are some of your questions. What are some of your thoughts about the story? What are some of your thoughts about the lessons that flow from it? But maybe, um, you know, Dr. Klina, to just start off this uh, discussion, yes. I appreciate that the relationship I, that men have shared with the sea has been fostered by stories that have been shared from generation to generation. And I- Very much so. Just wanted to question what inspires the stories and if you could just add on by just also telling us the impact of, of these stories in in keeping our traditional ways uh, yeah. Ngabong, Ngabong, one of the one of the most amazing things about um, stories, they are mythical. They are stories um, that we say uh, come from long, long ago. They are um, talking about events that we don't know for sure um, that uh, how they happened. But when you look at what where science is taking us today things that we thought were not possible, things that we mm. thought belonged in the, in the long, long ago, uh, in Tsohomi, in Ganewane, fairy tales, whatever we call them, they become a reality now because people are diving and finding all of those things we used to talk about that were down at the very bottom of the ocean. You see, mm. under the ocean, there are mountains. Under the ocean, the, 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 there's, the, there's the, the coral reef. There's, there's, there's so much, the, the, the creatures that are under the ocean, some of them we don't even have the names of in our languages, but there they are. And if we pretend as if they don't matter, if we pretend that we are the only ones that matter, we are going to suffer the consequences. 
So I think mythology is there to, 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 to connect us. These invisible threads connect us mm -hmm. to science, to what is seen with many, many researchers. You've got uh, Oloiso, you've got uh, uh, Prof. Um, Kerry Sink, uh, who, who do all of this kind of work, this biodiversity work on a daily mm -hmm. basis. And so if we take storytelling and we bring it to science and bring it together, there's so much wealth that we can bring to not only younger generations, but to the, the to, to community, to humanity at large. Mm -hmm. And it is up to us then to use this knowledge and research even more, because mm -hmm. we will never stop. We, mm -hmm. we must ask questions, we must ask questions. But one of the things, um, um, that, that my father used to say, I learned a lot from, from my parents, from my grandparents. My father used to say, the most beautiful word in Isizulu is Ngeabonga. Thank you. And Ugubonga, it is not only Ugubonga, but it is also to, Ugonga is to save and preserve. Ugu, Ugubonga is also to praise, to cherish, to celebrate. And uh, Uguaba is to share what you've got. So we are, we are bonga, oh, you, you, you praise, you celebrate, you are preserving. We need to do all of those things if we are to survive as a species on this earth. And so for me, telling the stories of the ocean is exactly about that. And, and I, 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 I'm always heartbroken when I see how people feel so comfortable throwing rubbish in the streets, throwing rubbish in the, in, in the rivers. We grew up looking at rivers as the veins uh, that uh, the blood veins of, of, of our very lives, or the blood veins of Mother Earth. And these veins, they make their way to the welcoming arms of the ocean. So if we dirty and pour, pour all kinds of filth into the rivers, we are swearing at Mother Nature. We are defiling mm. the, the, the ocean that, that we need so much. And so for me, we need to re-educate one another. We need to bring back that respect and be grateful that we have lived this far. So that's mm. what I would say, not only about storytelling, but about the work that is being done by so many, many people. Yes, mm. that is a dolphin. Yeah, <laughs> uh, powerful, really, really powerful stuff. And um, you are drawing in to say, yes, they might have originated from myths that scientists are doing a lot of work. And just on that point, I just want to bring in Dr. Sink. Um, and we can see that there's a lot of rich knowledge and understanding and the relationship with the aquatic ecosystem. My question mm. is to you is that, is, is science research interested in investigating indigenous relationships with the aquatic ecosystem? And if yes is the answer, have some of these things that we now come to know as indigenous knowledge, have, have they been proven as, as true? Thanks, Freddie. Um, I think um, multiple disciplines of, of science and also other disciplines are very interested in indigenous knowledge. And so I, I'm seeing a trend of, of indigenous knowledge being increasingly embraced and investigated. Um, in my own case, Luiso and I working in the One Ocean Hub We've been looking at the use of marine species in medicine and mm. ritual, and it's been such a fascinating journey, and I've learned a lot. But I think there's examples from all cultures all over the world where um, you no know, scientists are very proud. For example, we've discovered the coelacanth, very famous mm. story in Africa, but actually the people living and fishing in the Comores knew about the coelacanth and even the Gombesa in Indonesia a long time before. So you yeah. know, this really the value of, of, of listening, the Lelo um, and and learning. Um, in my own example, I'd like to share one, one story with you, which came actually while I was doing my PhD, I was working on a project in, in Northern KwaZulu Natal at Mapelon at Sukulu with um, women who were harvesting mm. mussels and we were doing work to study what we call recruitment, which is the baby mussels that settle onto the rocks. And we, I had to do a huge amount of work and the ladies laughed at me and they said, why are you doing this? Because we used to screw uh, little brushes onto the rocks and then count the baby mussels. And they told me, no, when the Mzinsi tree flowers, the coral tree, the Erythrana, one of our beautiful trees, that's when you know 
the muscles are ripe and full and the best to eat. Um, and that, it took a long time and 12 scientists and one scientific paper to show what these ladies knew all along, which is that the muscles coincide their spawning with the flowering of the Mzinzi tree in the spring. So that's just my own mm. my example. Yay, yeah. And Umsitsi is an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, tree. And um, the fact that it is called uh, the, the coral uh, in English and then the, the, the coral in the ocean, isn't that fascinating? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm amazing. I'm, I'm just watching when you see me watching, I'm actually looking at the comments that are coming through. Thank you very much for interacting with us. We, we, we are glad to be uh, hearing from you. I think uh, just a comment from Maria. A wonderful story, she says. We need more stories of hope. So the story is a story of hope. They certainly have impact and should be heard far and wide. Scientists are not always good at telling stories in such uh, animated ways, and we need these critical collaborations with artists. Thank you so much for sharing your talent. But then a question comes, she says, how can we improve collaborations on a global level? So that relationship between, you know, we, we now say it's STEAM, right? Which includes, which includes arts. How can we foster that relationship? Um, what has been your experience? Uh, I mean, Dr. Glina, you have worked on a lot of science projects. Maybe you could just elaborate yes. on, on your experience thus far. The other day I was um, watching um, the youth from hmm, what island now? I think they come from, from Haiti. There's Haiti, there's Barbados, so they, they, from the Caribbean. And um, these are, are youth that are, are working so hard for climate change. So I was watching some of their videos and what they, what they are interested in. And at the very end of the video, these young people had um, tables and they took their laptops and um, they were looking very fancy and very um, happening. And so what's wrong with being young and good looking, huh? And they went, they sat in the water. And so all of these tables were in the water. They were like in a boardroom in the water. And um, they were busy on their laptops and their cell phones and what. And they were being engulfed. Finally, they were engulfed by water and the, 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 the laptops and the cell phones and until the water came up to here. And they say, if we don't look out, the ocean will swallow us. Global warming is a reality. Mm -hmm. And when young people wake up to this thing, uh, the grown-ups, we can ignore global warming and uh, climate change at our own peril. So for me, I think there's so much collaboration with people from different parts of the world and to learn what um, other people have to say, uh, because different cultures tell stories differently. I like to listen to stories from other cultures because uh, for me, I'm always, I'm always inspired and uh, when I hear a story from another part of the ocean or, or of the world, I'm thinking, Ooh, we need to share that story. We need to tell people about that story, whether it comes from Chile, whether it comes from um, Jamaica, whether it comes from Sweden, it comes from Canada. Um, and, and those stories need to be also, what is the word? I, I think people like Judy Mann at Ushaga Marine, they know about my passion for, for, for tortoises and turtles. They know how much I love turtles. I think we need to, to honor the, the, the animals that are our family animals. Once we start doing that, you've got people who are called or, 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 or they are related to the to the dolphin. There are people on Tim Kool who are related to, to, to the to the baobab, or people who are related to Indov or the elephant. We've got all these different creatures we are related to. Let's honor them. Let's honor them. Or Pungane, they are related to, to the to the what is it called in the bumblebee and also the crab. And so it is up to us to 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 say when we are talking about indigenous knowledge systems, it's not something to be fancy and being didactic and being um, academic and and speaking big language to people who don't know what you're talking about. Let's bring it back home so that everybody who knows us gets to learn something bit mm. by bit. So collaboration. That's my middle name. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, and we really appreciate oh, no, that. Lama, they're going to teach me stuff. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. I, I just want to carry on and maybe just pick up on you, Loiso. And we're just really wanting to pick up from where Dr. Uh, Sink uh, left off. Uh, I mean, she is saying that scientists are interested in indigenous knowledge, right? 
And I just wanted you to just pick up from a point of saying, what is then the link between indigenous knowledge and, um, and, and science? What is the link? And I know there's, there's a lot that you can, but what are some of the major links that you have found to be present and, and alive? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, platform and this opportunity. Let me quickly say it's quite an honor to be in the same room with Mama. It's, yeah, I'm sitting here, I'm marveling. You're taking me back to Eastern Cape when I would sit with my grandfather and then I hear stories. You just took me back home. It's quite yeah, an honor. It's, it's quite an honor. And go somewhere, and go somewhere. So like, yeah, to answer that question, like what we've been investigating with Prof Singh is goes back to us trying to find that link. I come from Eastern Cape. I come from a background whereby we revere the ocean. So as more and more I learn science, as more and more I become a scientist, I want to see what is the trade-off between that. But Dr. Singh has been, Prof Singh has been talking to me a lot about why do I hold back most of the times if I have to go to the ocean? And then now I had to tell him more about the stories I was told when I was growing up. Stories similar to the one that Mama Tuna just shared now. Stories of being afraid of the ocean, not for the fact that it's scary, it's an animal that's gonna bite you, but stories that show you the meaning, the deeper meaning of what lies beneath, way beyond our imagination. So for me, when I look at it, science is knowledge, indigenous knowledge is knowledge also. So the link is there in the sense that these are two sets of knowledge. And then for us to actually find the link is when we can find a place whereby we can integrate them to get to the best results. The, a similar story with what Prof just shared right now. We sit a scientist in the room in our labs and then you, you, you hit a blank wall, you don't know how to proceed. But if you can interact with the people in a community about something, voila, what would normally take us like papers, years of papers to write, then it's just there, it's indigenous knowledge that is there. So there is a huge link, but these mm. are parallel sets of, 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 of knowledge or information. Mm. Oh, that's, that's, that's very powerful. And you speak about being afraid and, and the deep sea. Um, I really want to pick up on that. I mean, uh, Prof, Prof Singh, you have been underwater for consecutive months in some cases, and uh, I've seen varied, uh, you know, a, a variety of species there. I would, I would like to know, you know, what is the furthest that you have gone and what are some of the interesting mm. findings that you have found there? So, Freddie, um, me, myself, I haven't been very far physically, only to 100 meters, although even that is quite something because it's, it's quite technical diving and mix, mixtures of gases. So it was a, a real privilege to go down physically to the edge of Jessa Canyon. I, I was trying to see a coelacanth and, and look over the edge. Um, but by submarine, I've had the privilege to be at about 330 meters. And then recently with a GoPro inside a housing, we were able to see the South African seabed at one, just over 1000 meters as part of the deep secrets cruise. So, Woo! I mean, we got to see we we're on the surface Yay! on the ship, but we, we're always looking beneath. Um, and my students all laugh at me when I go to sea because I struggle to sleep because I don't want to miss out on anything. And we're out there and um, the, the ship has a thing called an echo sounder that draws a picture of the seabed as you travel. I always like to watch it. One of my most favorite discoveries was, and also something that we did not discover because the fishermen definitely knew about it, but scientists didn't know about it. So uh, there were, there's a feature of Elizabeth that we call the Kingclip Ridge and it's like an undersea mountain that's 40 kilometers long, but only 500 meters wide. And it comes up 300 meters high off the seabed as a long wall. And that's where our king clip, one of our very valuable fish for eating, gathers to spawn. Um, and they make noises, they drummers, they call across the ocean to each other, and they gather there. But um, the other, it's really exciting. You, you see things that you don't know what they are. So that's always really important. There are not a lot of people anymore who get to explore as part of their job. And that's something that yeah. I really do is the chance to explore and visit places that we that no one has ever seen before. But but yeah, I'm 
fascinated by the detail and and the small things and and the and the discoveries of new things that we don't know what they are yeah are there parts i think it's just a follow-up question discovery is so important yes. indeed i'm indeed. So just saying we never stop discovering Mm. And um, sometimes uh, people are looking at the fact that people are going to be doing research mm. in universities and laboratories and they are doing uh, um, work that will um, uh, earn them uh, what academic titles. And these are very, very important. These uh, academic titles, they also um, open doors in places where you didn't know you could go to, but at the same time, to, to, to be humble enough to say the people who can hardly um, say I made it to standard six or seven and um, have got so much knowledge as well. And what, like Loiso was saying, to say I, I, I'm ready to listen to, to the elders and, and hear what they have to say and people who are living this life. You know, the, 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 for instance, traditional healers, uh, our own healers, when they uh, find something that they can assist you with and they, they spot something that are those people who are able to talk to you without you even asking for help. They can see, <laughs> they can see what, what, what's, what's happening in your life. Mm -hmm. And they go ahead and they tell you, hello, do you even know my name? <laughs> so these are mysteries that science can never understand, can never fathom. And I think um, also what people choose um, to fear and, 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 and people, who, because when we are scared, it's always a fear of the unknown. Every single time we are scared of something is because we don't know anything about it. And when we say, listen, there's somebody who knows about it. Can I just sit and listen? Well, what do you know? You mean you went there? You mean you didn't die? You're back? Yes, I didn't die, I'm back. <laughs> and, and so when we think about you, going <laughs> down to the ocean and all of that, I mean, I love water. And, and, and so when, when you think of people who are scared of, uh, for instance, of, of, of being in a, in a forest, when I went to the, to the what do you call it, the Titicama forest, I went with, with my editor, we just knew, the two of us, that we shouldn't talk mm. because we are in a place of, of thousands of years ago that just don't talk, mm. just be still. Because the, those, those trees there, the, the, they had something to say to us. And I think the same applies to when you greet the ocean, when you greet the creatures that come from the ocean that you don't understand the language of, or the most of the meaning of, but just be still mm. and accept. Mm. And for me, the pause button is hit by the ocean because my life yeah. is on fast forward. I'm doing so many things at the same time and the ocean knows how to find the pause button. Be still, yeah. it's okay. Let the ocean be, and I'm grateful for this in Zulu and Pitagalo in Zulu as man. Mm. That's that's really powerful, and 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 the comments that are coming that are concurring, uh, you know, with what I'm saying. I think I'm just going to read some of the comments that are coming through. John, he uh, uh, says, "Thank you for sharing information on nature, family names." Gail, thank you, Dr. Cleaner, for wonderful story. I love that you are a champion of collaboration. It helps us to see. The links and realize how interconnected we are. Thank you. Um, Pilo, uh, Pilo, Pilo Nche, yes, says wonderful story indeed. Stories bring about emotions that revive the passion to continue working to serve the, uh, the ocean. Penny is the last one that I'm just going to take for now, says that I love Dr. Guinness observation about fairy tales becoming, rea uh, uh, becoming reality through scientific discovery. It is amazing how scientific, uh, science unravels uh, un the mysteries of our existence. Uh, bring storytelling and science together. Poetry, literature, and storytelling are vehicles uh, for answering questions about human, uh, uh, humans on Earth. So I think there's a lot of good feedback that is coming. Please allow me to just shift a little bit this discussion. And I just want to touch a little bit on uh, about you know marine protected areas, Dr. Sink. Mm. Um, and you know, we have these areas that are protected. What I want to know as a starting point uh, is that are some of these areas linked to our heritage at all? Um, I think there are links with our heritage. So for example, South Africa has got 
coastal caves with evidence about where modern humans evolved. And, and one of the ideas is that modern humans got their brain power from eating the fats and nutrients in seafood like shellfish. And some of this evidence is um, adjacent to existing protected areas and those resources. So if you take a very long-term view, that is something, but also protected areas are, are conserving and looking after resources that, that are valued by so many different fishing cultures in South Africa, for example. But it's important mm. to recognize that protected areas are not without impact on culture and that we still have many issues mm. to address in this, in this space. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry, I just wanted to hit you with a follow up very quickly there. It is coming from the fact that indigenous people have a culture, uh, have, have a culture that relates to land and sea in a holistic way, right? Um, and as we increase these uh, marine protected areas, is there a risk to overlook and diminish indigenous connections to the aquatic ecosystem? I think that risk is very much present. Um, if you aren't mindful and if you're not practicing conservation with empathy, if you're not meaningfully engaging stakeholders, um, you know, we're doing work now in, in the One Ocean Hub to, to draw more from across disciplines. And I'm learning a lot about how to tailor engagements for, for different user groups. So. We're learning about different ways of knowing and we're also having to pioneer how to practically take um, cultural information and social information and use it in our planning for protected areas and that's a that's quite a difficult thing to do we don't know how to do it so that's an important area for us to to work together to try and figure out new ways of planning for protected areas to make sure that um, we can make the most of the potential role of protected areas and looking after sacred places. So, so for example, one of the areas that there's been discussion about is hole in the wall. And I'm sure um, um, Dr. Klee yeah. could tell us stories about hole in the wall yeah. in, 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 the, in, that, in that area by Coffee Bay. And be able. We, we need to be able to diversify our planning and, and our benefits from protected areas. I, I would like to, to talk about, you know, when I'm, I'm from 45 minutes away from here, that's where I come from, Hammersdale. And um, when we moved to this place for the first time, we found out about the sardine run. Born and bred in South Africa, we knew nothing about the sardine run. And uh, now I'm living on the bluff and I can stand here and watch the whole big ocean sardine run and I watch this, the, the feeding frenzy and uh, to see birds dive bombing the fish. It's like a, it, it, it's raining birds. And to watch all of that, the, the, the wisdom of the birds, to the, 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 the way they can see so far and know which fish they're picking up and then after the dive bombing, and then you see that they lift up the shark nets and then the dolphins come and then the whales come and the, 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 the sardines that they make themselves into this big, big um, defense mechanism, this cloud. And then the other animals, they break in, they start to be feeding on them. People go and pick up the sardines. I, I, that is something we discovered only because we moved here to the bluff. We didn't know any of these things. This apartheid uh, that also separated people mm. from the most beautiful spaces in our country. Mm. And then there's another, uh, another thing I discovered moving here. People kept saying, did you know about the whaling station? First, I thought it was a whaling station, like crying, a place for crying, I thought, a whaling station, why would they be? <laughs> and they said, no, a whaling station. Okay, a whaling station is that, why would whales need a station? Hmm? It turns out so many years ago, they used to, they built a platform. There was a place where they killed so many whales and they took the fat to France and they chopped, they took the blubber, they left it on the ocean. That's why the price of houses in this area was not so high because of the smell. Apparently the smell was unbearable of the rotting blubber on the sand here on the bluff. Can you imagine the number of souls of those whales that were killed 
here on the bluff. Think of, of the, the killing fields. It was like a war, right? And then you've got him, um, you've got him, um, the, 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 this time now, this year, this uh, coronavirus, corona, corona comes, he forces us to sit still, to stay home. We don't know what he looks like. We don't know how big or tall he is. We don't know his voice, but he's here. He's collecting lives. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. spoke, is it Posa? Now you might know a poem by Umkai. Ati ukoka kuka ngolio kotuga. Tope manabe kapatali kuli into dini dini. Ogo fa. Now there's a poem about death. Yeah. <laughs> and Corona is about that. If Umkai was here, he would say, "I told you so. I told you." And now this yeah. year, because of the COVID nineteen, because of the the people are not cruising, people are not disturbing nature. We see birds we haven't seen in a long, long time. We mm -hmm. see nature reclaiming their own spaces. I've never seen so many whales. They're just whales frolicking outside. I'm thinking they've come to reclaim the place where they used to be killed so many years ago. They've mm -hmm. come to reclaim the place. And I'm oh, saying the oh. whales are saying to us, wake up humanity, wake up humanity, respect nature, honor. Honor, honor nature, you shall live long. Wake up humanity, wake up humanity, respect nature, and you shall live long. Really, I think we uh, time is, is, is becoming an enemy, as always, when things are really, really fun, you know, time is against us. But Lois, so I think there is, I just want to pick up on a point that Umam Kuna mentioned, and it relates to, you know, um, apartheid came and relocated people and there are people that feel like such relocations were um, systematic uh, strategy to separate them from their in, uh, indigenous knowledge systems and practices. Yeah. My question is how do we keep these things alive? And I'm asking you this question only because I know that you're coming from both sides where you understand the practice but also understand the need for law to operate and preserve Thank you, thank you, Freddy, so much. Uh, yeah, that the, if I can answer that question, I, I can take the whole time, the little time that is remaining we have. But the only uh, story that I can share to answer that question is I was chatting with uh, Prof because uh, we, we, as part of the One Ocean Hub, we're evaluating ways of retaining this knowledge and making sure that people understand more and more, making sure there's more diversity. In, in conservation of our marine biodiversity. So um, I was telling you about my grandfather. They, they, my journey into the marine space was quite difficult for starters. My family did not support it at all because they were scared for my life. They are scared because of the indigenous knowledge that they have. So I didn't have full of that knowledge. So I didn't understand much what they are scared of. But when I kept chatting with Prof about this, she said to me one day like, Lois, so our time is running. We need to actually go to these libraries. People like Mamutina, our libraries. My grandfather is a library, oh. a working library, and the time yeah. is short. They are not going to be with us forever. So the sooner we actually oh. transform our science or integrate them into our science. My grandfather tells me amazing stories. Some I don't believe. Some I can't even say the meaning. When I understand them, I'm too embarrassed. I'm too shy about them. But the sooner we actually look at them, the sooner wow. we look at them as an important link in progressing our mm. science and maintaining heritage here, too, the sooner we can be able to go forward and then well guided when we go forward into this future. Ah, this is powerful. I, I, I it is really wow. powerful. I, I do hate that time is, 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 is against us, but powerful, powerful things that are coming through. Um, Mom Trina, there is something that I just want to ask you as we are wrapping up now is to say that there is great pride in traditional connection with the sea, but over the years, this seems to be changing. Um, the 21st uh, century young, uh, young people largely see uh, the sea as a place of leisure. So we just go there when it's Christmas time. I would like to know, you know, how can we keep this important knowledge from, and I know storytelling is one of them, 
And what are some of the initiatives that, uh, you know, Trina Masiko is doing to make sure that our young people are invested, they're interested? I will answer that question on condition. Lois tells me, and um, which village he comes from in the Eastern Cape. If he answers that question, I will answer you as well. Dumkate, Bum Timuku, Lupunga, Nutabeka Zombi, Nomashabat, and Oshabat in common upon the side. The Sukang Mala, Eastern Cape. We are tetagging with Yavuvango. How do we get in course? How do we get young people? to be interested in, um, in, in, in the ocean, in, in, in nature, in biodiversity. We need to find different ways of packaging, you know, mm -hmm. of packaging this knowledge. And also saying some of these things in indigenous languages. I keep repeating mm -hmm. that storytellers are language lovers. If we do not mm -hmm. share this information in our languages as well, they're gonna just hear some strange words that we are saying and they sound lovely, um, well, they are, apparently it's important for you to do it when you're going to pass your exams and then you leave it alone. So we need to live the life that we want our young people to cherish. One of the things we did um, during um, in the past few months, we went with my daughter, with our family, with a filming crew. They do a lot of work uh, in youth here in, in Devon. They do environmental uh, filmmaking and, and, and stuff like that. I would love working with them on the well. We went down to the ocean and we went to greet the rising sun. Mm -hmm. And when we sang in front of the ocean and watched the sun rising, I think there must have been 30 dolphins that came frolicking, jumping, almost like they were hearing the song. we should enjoy this work we do. It should be infectious. So that young people say, this grandmother is a dumb problem. No, Mama Lo is having too much fun. Let's go join her. Let's have some fun in learning about our heritage because all of this nature is our heritage. We can't preserve something we don't love and celebrate. Let's love it. Like we talk about people going back to eating indigenous food, our own food that doesn't have too much salt, not too much oil, not of all of these things that bring us a high blood pressure and all kinds of other sicknesses. The same thing has to do with us honoring nature. Because when we do that, we are just learning. So like something, like, like um, uh, Prof. Kerry Sink said, uh, eating the, the, the fish and, and, and the, 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 the food from the ocean stimulates our brains. I will say being aware, fully present in what nature or the ancient songs the birds sing or the trees, all of what is around us, it also reawakens our own ancient wisdoms. Our ancestors speak to us in tongues and we know those tongues. And science ah. first, sky first is speaking in tongues to humanity all over the world. Let's keep on collaborating and growing together. I've met you now, Prof. Sink, Loiso. I'm not letting go of you. We're going to work together. I hope you're not going to run away. <laughs> Never. Powerful, 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 powerful. Thank you to those that are sending messages. I do apologize. We could not go through all of them. When there are questions, what we'll try and do is that after the session, we will get written responses and we will try and respond. I'll just pick up on one more comment. Kira says, thank you so much, Carrie, my mom, Trina, Loiso, watching this with two children and it was so important to hear. So this is the impact that we are having. 
um, and 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 it might seem like just a session, but it is changing perspective. We are learning, unlearning, and relearning some of the things that we need to for us to go forward. I just want to give this time um, to all of you to just in 30 seconds to just leave us with last words. Let me start with you, Loiso. Last words, and as we wrap up. What I got from Mama's story today is that we will never stop learning. We we'll always learn. And the moment we stop learning is the moment we die. So I'm so honored to be in this space. And thank you for everyone that joined us. Thank you. Thank you. Prof Sink. Also, Freddie, thank you so much for organizing this session. Um, I'm really deeply touched and inspired. I like, have this vision of a collection of stories for our ocean ecosystems, and, and we're going to get it done. Um, you know, a, a wise Zulu man taught me once, gangani, gangani, inja and and oh. that is the, the approach. <laughs> like, together, we can slowly learn. And, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very so much, much. Prof. Sink. Uh, Dr. Kleena? I think um, we have started these uh, online collaborations. We are not in the same city. We are not in the same room, but we certainly are in the same space. And we are connecting with people in different parts of the world. And let's not stop. We've started this. Let's spread our wings. When we spread our wings like this, there's no stopping us. We can reclaim our connection with not only nature, but with humanity at large. Yeah, uh, cool, Freddie, and uh, science, um, uh, the, the South African National Science Festival. And course, and course, Kakulu, Mama, Siabulela. And thank you to also you that were watching us. Uh, we really appreciate this session would not have been the same without your interaction. I just want to say Southwest Africa has taken on an ambitious, some have called it Jenny, to have a six month festival. And in this current month, we will be celebrating and looking and focusing on climate change. Just to tell you of some of the things that are coming up on Thursday, we have the uniqueness of South African plant diversity and the role of botanical gardens in plant conservation. On uh, Friday at 3 p.m., uh, we have uh, a session titled EcoBricks, a solution within the green economy. Please do visit our website and see what's coming. And also all past uh, recorded sessions will also be there. Interact with them. If you have any questions, please do send, um, please do send uh, your questions to us at info at cyphers.org.za. You will see that uh, email also on our website. Thank you so very much. Thank you to Dr. Greener. Thank you to Prof. Singh. Thank you to Loiso. And with this from us, we sign out. Thank you. Have a lovely evening.